Welcome to the Damcasters. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for putting up with my enforced absence for the last few weeks. The Lurg is still with me, but we're back and we have a fantastic episode for you. In 1919, the forerunner to the United States Air Force, the Air Service, staged an audacious transcontinental air race. While flying coast to coast had never really been done before, the head of the training and operations group, Brigadier General Billy Mitchell, decided that making it a round trip race would be even better than just going one way. So in October 1919, using war surplus aircraft, including British and German single seat scouts, the great air race began. Former Washington Post foreign correspondent and pilot John Lancaster has retraced the routes of men like Tui Spatz and the flying parson Belvin Maynard back and forth across the United States in his new book, The Great Air Race. But as we start our conversation, I have to ask John how he found out about this race, which seems lost to us, even those of us who are the most ardent of AV geeks. That's one of the more curious aspects of this story, because at the time it was a, you know, it was a huge story. It dominated the news for several weeks in 1919. There were 30 stories in the New York times, eight of them on the front page. I mean, it, it was, it was really the biggest thing going. I mean, when I first ran across a reference to it, when I was, I was sort of vaguely searching for a, a book idea in the aviation field. And I was uh, reading an old book on airplane racing in the interwar period. Uh, that was published in 1976. It was kind of a seminal book on air racing called The Speed Seekers, uh, which is worth reading if you haven't. But anyway, it's mostly about sort of, you know, pylon racing on closed courses, which was very popular, you know, attracted crowds of 100,000 in Cleveland in the 20s and 30s. And the book just in passing mentioned this transcontinental air race or, you know, devoted, you know, maybe a few paragraphs to it. And I thought, well, that's odd. That sounds like a big deal. And I haven't heard of it. Um, and I said, surely someone's written a book on it. Um, that's usually my experience when I stumble across something that seems like a good book idea. I, I go on Amazon and there's 20 books on the same subject. Um, <laughs> but uh, in this case, uh, there was nothing. Um, I could find almost nothing about it, uh, at least in, in contemporary aviation histories. There were a few, a few books that mentioned it. Uh, and one or two that went into some detail, but no, no specific book on this subject. And I, I found, you know, in the course of my research, I, you know, it, it wasn't just my own ignorance. I mean, even people like yourself who are pretty well schooled in aviation seem to be largely ignorant of this race. And, and in fact, when we were shopping the book to publishers, uh, a few years ago, my, my agent and I, an editor at one of the big New York publishing houses, literally the first question out of his mouth was, how come I've never heard of this? So, I mean, I have, I have a theory on that. I, I think it has to do with, with uh, the fact that Lindbergh kind of eclipsed everything that went before him, at least since the Wright brothers. But, you know, in a way it was nice because it, I knew I had a lot of running room. It was, it's always fun, you know, as a reporter, I always enjoyed having a story to myself and I knew I had this one to myself. When you got in touch, we started chatting about this. You started mentioning some of the names in, in, in the blurb. You know, you've got Tui Spots, you've got Hap Arnold involved. Then, of course, you've got Billy Mitchell, who's the First World War in the 20s and the 30s is this sort of, for a man who was never in charge of the what became the U.S. Air Force, he's such a domineering character. I, I suppose that's where we really have to start because this was one of his many... I don't want to say schemes, but it was sort of plans to get the, the air service as it was then in, into more of a firm footing with the, the two traditional services. So I guess the easiest question to ask is who, who was he and, and, and why did he want to be the top dog in the air service? Well, I think Billy Mitchell, he, you know, he came from a, an aristocratic background. He had, a, I think, a strong sense of entitlement. His grandfather was one of the wealthiest men in the middle Midwest, uh, it was a, basically a railroad robber baron and banker. Uh, and so Willie came from, from wealth, uh, Willie, as he was called by his family as a child. And, you know, he, I, he's one of these people, I think, who just always, you know, knows that he's kind of destined for greatness in some sense. I, I suspect his parents told him that uh, on occasion. 
but uh, particularly his mother, to which whom he adored. And, you know, he was also, let's give him credit, he was also quite brilliant in, in some ways. I mean, he really, um, I think, did see much earlier than most that air power was going to decide the course of future wars. But he, he, was, he was drawn to the military at an early age. He, he, he volunteered during the, the uh, Spanish-American War uh, at, around the turn of the century and uh, proved to be a very capable young officer uh, with assignments. Uh, he he uh, saw combat in the Philippines during the insurrection there, um, and, uh, or I really should say the, the anti-colonial rebellion, and also in Alaska, where he helped uh, basically build the telegraph system in, in the wilds of Alaska. He had a thirst for adventure. Uh, he was drawn to aviation uh, much sooner than most of his peers. He learned to fly at his own expense in 1916, even before the United States entered the war. Uh, and, uh, uh, he was, you know, already establishing himself by that point as, as, as a sort of a military thinker. And he'd written articles suggesting that air power was going to play an increasingly important role, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in the wars of the future. And the army, I think rather wisely, uh, sent him sort of, uh, sent him to Europe to, uh, gather information on how air power was being used on the Western Front, even before the first American troops arrived. And so this was uh, around the time that the United States declared war in uh, the spring of 1917. Uh, and he was a very eager student of, of the French and British uh, air forces and the tactics they used uh, and uh, you know, soaked up information like a sponge and developed uh, you know, very early in the game and you know, developed a very strong sense of its, of its importance. And of course, at that point, he was really, the United States was playing catch up uh, because, you know, uh, of necessity, the, the warring powers in Europe had uh, embraced the airplane fairly early in the game because they, you know, they grasped its importance first for reconnaissance and then for, uh, you know, bombing and strafing and, and whatnot. And, uh, uh, but Mitchell saw that the United States had fallen behind. He was, you know, deeply patriotic. Uh, and hugely ambitious. Um, he had quite a healthy ego, I would say. Uh, and um, he was determined that the United States uh, should, you know, not only catch up, but but eventually, uh, uh, you know, dominate uh, this this new field. Um, and and, in, and all credit to him, he as the head of air, American air combat operations on the Western Front in 1918, uh, he orchestrated the largest aerial assault uh, of the war. Uh, in the Battle of San Miguel, uh, which was, uh, uh, you know, considered a great success. Um, and so he, he really knew what he was talking about. When he got back, he was, he was I think, widely regarded as, you know, probably the, the, the best expert that the United States had in this field. And he sort of tended to guess in his own way, didn't he? Which is why he, he never, never got the top job. He... I guess today we'd say he didn't really have a filter, did he? It just sort of all his opinion came out and he expected it to be taken as gospel. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. I mean, he was he was one of these, he, he was sort of, he just couldn't help himself. <laughs> he didn't know when to <laughs> shut up. Uh, he was, uh, uh, you know, often, you know, borderline insubordinate and of course ultimately would be court-martialed for insubordination in 1925. But even before that, he, you know, he drove his superiors to distraction because he, he, you know, he was constantly pushing back, arguing. Uh, he was not the type of dutiful officer who just kind of clicks his heels and says, yes, sir. Um, and, you know, he drove Pershing, you know, John Pershing, the uh, uh, general in charge of the American Expeditionary Force, almost sent him home because he was such a pain in the neck. Uh, but to Pershing's credit, he recognized uh, uh, Mitchell's skills as a combat leader and, and kept him on. And, 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 and that was always what saved Mitchell was his competence. Um, uh, and, um, or at least it saved him until it didn't. Um, uh, but, uh, certainly during the war, his, 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 he, I mean, he was awarded the distinguished service cross, which was the second highest medal after the congressional medal of honor, which I think, you know, reflected uh, his standing in the, uh, in the army at that time. So let's get into this period. So they've, they've come home from the war. There's a big exhibition that you go into some fantastic detail about in your book, which we're, we're going to leave to the readers. But there's a there's an air race in 1919 between New York and Tokyo. How did this sort of capture Mitchell's imagination for something a little bit grander? Uh, well, you meant Toronto, not Tokyo. <laughs> I did. Sorry. The thing is, um, 
<laughs> on my notes, dear listener, I've got Hap Arnold. And when I hear Hap Arnold, my brain immediately goes to the Pacific. But there, there part, are, yes. A pardonable error. Um, uh, that would have been an amazing race. Yeah, yes. yeah, that was like a dry run. I mean, to, to, to back up a step, even before New York, Toronto, just to give you a little bit of the context for that race and, and the one that followed, the one that I wrote about, well, actually, I wrote about both of them. But with the armistice in November uh, 1918, uh, American aircraft, aircraft production just, you know, screeched to a halt. I mean, all of this, this, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars had been appropriated for aircraft construction the largest single purpose appropriation uh, for anything in American history, uh, and uh, w which is kind of an astonishing data point in itself. Even with all that money, they just got into the game too late uh, to really produce much of value for the front, except for one aircraft, the DH-4, which plays a prominent role in the race. But uh, in any case, uh, you know, these air aircraft companies just, they were either, they either had to go out and close their doors and go out of business or they were really struggling. I mean, Boeing, a name I, I'm sure all your listeners are familiar with, uh, started making furniture and speedboats. I mean, they, there was just no market for airplanes. You know, the, there were no commercial airlines. Uh, the, the, the only real buyers were sort of rich dilettante sportsmen. Um, the barnstormers of, of that era who, you know, are, are got a lot of press at the time and, and have been written about a lot. Uh, they were all flying surplus Curtis trainers that they bought from the army for, you know, 300 bucks each. So that wasn't much of a market to keep the uh, avi aircraft industry going. So Mitchell, you know, having, you know, grasped the, 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 the importance of air power uh, was very concerned about maintaining an aircraft manufacturing base in peacetime because he knew, it would, you know, the next war, uh, that the United States would need one um, uh, to confront its enemies. Uh, so his challenge was to spark public and congressional support for, uh, for aviation, um, which meant, you know, spending money. And of course, at a time when the country was demobilizing, this was a very tough sell. Um, uh, so the, the, the New York-Toronto race was actually not his idea. This was an idea that originated uh, with one of the, uh, I think it was the Aero Club of America, uh, one of the aero clubs of the, of the day, there were several important ones and, uh, and Mitchell kind of latched on to it, uh, and, and, uh, got permission from his boss for, for American military flyers to compete in the race using government airplanes. Uh, and, um, it, you know, it was, it was actually a very successful event. It was a much shorter race than the one, uh, than the transcontinental race, obviously, um, I think about 700 miles maybe from Long Island to Toronto. And, uh, you know, it was a round trip race and um, they had about a week to complete it. Uh, no one was killed remarkably. There were a number of crashes and some people were hurt, but no one died. Uh, and the weather was terrible. I mean, uh, you know, just, just terrendous weather. It was, it, was, it was held in the summer where you think the weather is generally pretty good, but there were gale force winds and storms and over Lake Ontario. Um, and, uh, uh, but the fact that the pilots, you know, persevered and, and completed the journey, most of them anyway, uh, I think gave Mitchell the confidence to go ahead with his plans for this transcontinental race, you know, I guess about a month and a half, two months later. And that's key really, because it's the planning for this is incredibly tight, isn't it? That's, they yeah. gave them what, two? gave themselves a couple months to get everything. Not ready. even, not even. I mean, M Mitchell didn't even, I mean, really about two or three weeks. It was, it was late September wow. uh, that I think it's September 18th sticks in my mind. It, it may have been a day or two later, but it was, it was late sometime in the last third of September that Mitchell, you know, got permission from his boss, uh, the head of the air service to or organize this race and alerted air service stations across the country that this was going to happen. And they just had a couple of weeks to prepare. And, and you have to bear in mind, I mean, this is a time there's not a single paved runway in the United States. The only airfields for the most part, well, they're, they're just farmer's fields, essentially. Some, the air service has some training fields around the country, but there was certainly nothing like a transcontinental air route. There was no established route across the country. Uh, there were, there were the only established fields, there were, were the starting point in, in uh, Long Island at Roosevelt Field, which was an air service field. And at the Presidio in San Francisco, uh, the military base there, the, the air service had a field on San Francisco Bay. And then there was an, a, um, a uh, uh, US airmail field in Bryan, Ohio. But other than that, they needed, I think, 20 refueling stops along the way uh, that they just had to create almost overnight. 
Um, they had to, you know, identify the real estate for these fields. They had to mark them with limestone so that they could be seen from the air. They had to, of course, stock them with fuel and spare parts. Uh, they had to establish communications because they, you know, they needed at a minimum telegraph and ideally telephone communications from these fields. Uh, and uh, it all had to be done really, it, well, it really, in some cases it came down to a few days. I mean, in, in Green River, uh, Wyoming, the, the uh, uh, air service officer, the control officer, as he, as he was called in, in charge of the stop there, didn't even get there till a couple of days before the race and the field hadn't even been cleared. And it, on top of that, it snowed. So he had, you know, six or 12 inches of snow he had to contend with. And then he had to clear the field of sagebrush. So they, you know, they got 20 horse teams from the local uh, townspeople and all volunteers, and they, they got it done finally. Uh, but it was really just down to the wire. And that, that wasn't, wasn't unique. So what was the route they were going to be taking? So it's, we, we know the start, start and finish, but what, what about the, the big open bit in the middle? Well, they basically followed the Central and Union Pacific Railroad, at least west of Chicago. I mean, it was, it was, the route was sort of, if you, if you divide the country into a northern half and a southern half, there's, there is a southern transcontinental route and a northern transcontinental route. This was the northern route uh, through the sort of upper tier of states uh, in, in the west. That would be, you know, well, Nebraska, Wyoming, uh, uh, Utah, Nevada, um, as opposed to further south. And uh, it, it followed the Union Pacific Railroad west of Chicago. And uh, when you think about it, that makes perfect sense because for one thing, if you're building a railroad, you're obviously going to try and sort of follow the lower terrain and you don't want to have to tunnel through every mountain. Um, and in fact, that's what the Union Pacific Railroad uh, does. Um, and uh, I don't think it goes above seven or 8,000 feet. Um, and uh, uh, so in addition to that, it's, it gives you a logistical advantage because it makes it much easier to supply these fields with, with fuel, uh, for example, and uh, spare parts. Um, so, and, and of course, there's, there's towns along the way where, you know, that can provide lodging and, and other support for the, for the flyers. Uh, so it wasn't that difficult to plan the route. It was, it was definitely challenging to prepare it in time to make it suitable for, for airplanes. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, th that was the route that Mitchell chose. I, th I think without too much, uh, deliberation, I mean, they, they briefly, they did consider a Southern route, uh, but in the end they figured it was early enough in the season. It was early on going to be early October. So they thought, well, the weather will be okay over the Northern Rockies. So we don't need to worry too much about that. It turned out they were wrong. We can talk about that later. Um, but that was the theory and the final re the final advantage to, uh, following the UP railroad was it was a navigation aid. I mean, you know, there were no radio networks, there were no electronic beacons, you know, not even any lighted beacons along the route as there would be in subsequent years. So pilots had to rely on their, their compasses and their very rudimentary maps. And uh, these, neither one of these were particularly reliable. And so it was much easier just to follow the railroad, which of course many of them did. In fact, they called it the iron compass. So for all of those reasons, uh, Mitchell uh, chose that route. So we've got the route set up. Now, the, the key element here is that it's flyers going in both directions, isn't it? So it's not everybody starting in, in, in Long Island and, and heading west. It's sort of two groups that are going to sort of cross in the middle. That sort of creates an interesting thing because we, you know, Hap Arnold threw my mind earlier and I find him an absolutely fascinating character. So he's he's setting things up on in San Francisco on, on the West Coast as well. Is this creating a rivalry between the two halves of the air service? Uh, I, I think there was a there was a friendly rivalry between the, the you know as they were called the Western Department Flyers and the Eastern Department Flyers. I mean the thing that determined where you started was basically where you were based. So most of the flyers who flew out of uh, uh, the Presidio on the West Coast were based at Rockwell Field in uh, San Diego or Mather Field in Sacramento, and some of course at the Presidio. There may have been one or two others from Oregon from you know who were doing forest forest fire patrols up there. But for the most part, those those were the three bases on the West Coast. And then on the East Coast, you had a higher concentration of bases, a more heavily populated area. And and, and it, they were, you know, so they came from Langley Field in Virginia. They came from, of course, Roosevelt Field and its adjacent air service fields on Long Island. Um, other fields uh, uh, around, uh, up and down the East Coast. I mean, there weren't that many, but uh, there were more, there were more pilots on the East Coast than the West Coast. And so on the at the start of the race on October 8th, 1919, 48 started from Roosevelt Field on Long Island and 15 started from 
uh, uh, the Presidio in San Francisco. And, you know, part, so it was, again, it was partly just a logistical choice. Well, we, they obviously weren't going to get all the pilots who wanted to compete, you know, to come to the opposite coast. That would have been impractical. So this was a way to get around that. But it also, it also served to make the race more of a, a fair fight, so to speak, because uh, prevailing winds tend to blow from west to east, which is why it takes you less time in a jetliner to say to fly from, you know, LA or San Francisco to New York than it does when you're flying from east to west. And so uh, uh, this way, assuming they made the round trip journey, um, you know, each, each of the contestants would face the same uh, wind conditions uh, um, and uh, the difference would even out. Uh, so that's, that was sort of the logic of doing it that way. And back to your original question about the rivalry, I mean, yes, I mean, Hap Arnold was very eager for a, as he put it, a Western department man to win, but he was also, you know, he, he was not reckless and he, in fact, encouraged his guys to be safe. He said, look, you're, you're in a race, but the important thing is safety first. Now, a lot of them would disregard that advice, um, but, uh, but he tried. <laughs> you mentioned it in there. There's, there's the interesting spanner Mitchell throws in as well to make this a coast to coast to coast race, isn't he? He says they're going to turn around and come back because it saves them having to ship the, the aircraft back to their starting points as well. Right. That wasn't the original plan, was it? Uh, no, no, it, it wasn't. It was something that was that was really that they came up with at the last minute. I mean, there, they, you know, he, they really were winging it. I mean, for a while, there was talk of, well, we'll have a race from, you know, east to west. Uh, and then we'll have another race from west to east, but there'll be two separate races. And the one from west to east will be uh, the southern route because it's going to be, that won't be till November. But they decided that logistically it was just going to be too complicated and it was simpler just to do it uh, this way. Um, but yeah, I mean, the fact that they, I, I don't think they announced that it was a round trip until really just a few days uh, before the race. Um, so that just shows you how the whole thing was just really, really improvised. So let's talk about some of these flyers, because we, we mentioned Tui Spots earlier, a man who'd gone to remarkable things in Europe with the, the 8th and the 15th, I think he was, wasn't he? Um, but some of the other chaps that you've you've found were, I, I just was blown away by them, because you've got Belvin Maynard, who was a preacher flying with his dog and, and, his, and his mechanic. You've got Harold Hartley as well. These guys were characters, and I guess that's why this press really leapt into this because it wasn't just bland pilots taking off. These were guys with big personalities doing a big thing. That's exactly right, and it's actually one of the things that attracted me to the story was the sort of larger than life characters who 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 uh, play these important roles. I mean, you mentioned Belvin Maynard. I mean, he, yeah, he, I mean, he was sort of an oddity because he was, you know, this sort of, you know, teetotaling Baptist preacher from North Carolina, um, took a very dim view of, you know, alcohol and tobacco and, and flew with his, his German police dog, Trixie, that a friend of his had brought back from the battlefield in Europe. And, uh, so of course the press loved that. And, and there's these great pictures of, you know, <laughs> Maynard in the front cockpit and Trixie in the back, you know, sticking her head up into the wind. Uh, <laughs> she sat with the mechanic. Uh, so, so Maynard was, was a, de definitely a curiosity. He was also a brilliant pilot. He won the, the New York Toronto race. So he was already famous by the time of the transcontinental race. In fact, the press had already uh, anointed him with the nickname, the flying parson. Um, and, uh, and then some of the others, a few of the others like Cap Hartney, of course, were very famous combat aces. I mean, Hart Hartney was one of the most distinguished flyers of the war, as you know, then you had some others that perhaps were not famous, but but made names for themselves in the race just because of their sort of flamboyance and performance. My favorite, I think, is a guy named Braley Gish, who was a track star at the University of Washington, uh, you know, a decade or so before uh, the race. And he, uh, you know, at one point was one of the fastest quarter milers in the country, held the national record for the javelin throw, a really serious athlete, moved to Washington, D.C. after dropping out of college, opened a garage on Capitol Hill, which is, happens to be where I live in D.C., uh, and became a well-known racing car driver before the war and also learned to fly before the war just because, you know, that was the kind of thing that daring young men did at the time if they had the money. You know, was a scratch golfer and, you know, uh, palled around with congressmen and generals and sort of a, a man about town, very kind of... Oh, oh, to be a scratch golfer. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> 
but he, uh, so the interesting thing about Gish and his performance in the ring, Gish uh, on a training flight uh, after deploying to the Western Front or near to the, actually not straight to a combat squadron, but when he arrived in France, his first training flight was a night training flight. He crashed in fog and shattered both his legs. And so he spent, he spent a year in Walter Reed Army Hospital. He actually checked himself out of the race to fly in the New York Toronto race, which he almost won. I think he was third. Then he, then he went back to the hospital for further rehab and checked himself out again to fly in the transcontinental race. He had metal braces on his legs uh, and um, flew with crutches in the cockpit. When he actually landed in Chicago, uh, someone actually called for an ambulance because they didn't think he could walk you know, from his airplane. Uh, he waved it off. But so he, so he just, just, he showed tremendous grit. There's a lot, there are a lot of things that happened to him during the race, which we can get into later, but, but the press, you know, uh, was sort of enraptured, uh, with him in particular. But, uh, uh, anyway, I think they, they, those are some good examples of the, the types of people, uh, who flew in this contest. And they're not all flying the same thing. There's the, the, the mix of aircraft that they've, they've cobbled together for this. You, you've mentioned the DH-4. We can go into that in a second. But there's single-seat fighters as well. You've got a couple of SE-5As, some Fokker D-7s, which are amazing aircraft, but not airplanes that you'd want to fly across the continental U.S. in. What was this sort of mix? Because, you know, you've got some bombers in there. It doesn't seem like they put a lot of thought into it. It was just getting aircraft together that could fly. It's whatever they, they had. And, and, let, and let's be honest, I mean, most of these aircraft were verging on obsolescence, you know, by 1919. Uh, I mean, things were happening fast in aircraft development. And, uh, you yeah, know, these were all just leftover war surplus air, air, aircraft. It was just a motley collection of planes. It's whatever they could scrounge from, from their bases. And I think, you know, the DH-4, if, if you're picking... If you're choosing a, an airplane as a character, you'd have to say that the DH-4 was, you know, one of the main characters because most of the pilots did fly the DH-4. In some ways, a very capable airplane, two-seat observation and bombing plane. It was the only American-made combat aircraft, uh, even though based on a British design, but the only American-made combat aircraft that actually saw action on the Western Front. And, uh, you know, performed quite capably, but it also had a couple of fatal flaws. It was known as the, the fatal, the flaming coffin because it tended to ignite rather easily and uh, by virtue of its pressurized uh, gas tank. And also because the gas tank was located behind the pilot. Uh, so even in low speed crashes, the pilot would sometimes be crushed in the front cockpit, you know, in the otherwise survivable crashes. In fact, that happened to one of the pilots who was flying to start the race in Long Island, even before the race started, he was killed in an accident in DH-4. So a lot of pilots didn't really trust the DH-4. They, they thought it was a dangerous aircraft and they really they terrified them. The thought of landing it, like a forced landing on rough ground, really terrified them. As you mentioned then, you know, a number of single seat fighters. I think that you have to, if you want to pick out the most exotic, you have to focus on the, the D-7, which you mentioned. I mean, this was a fighter that was responsible for a lot of American deaths on the Western Front. It was, it was probably the most capable fighter of the war, had no flying wires because its wing was internally braced. So it was a very sleek uh, aircraft, had a very low stall speed. Uh, um, and uh, it, um, uh, you know, and it still was painted in its German insignia, it had a black iron cross on the fuselage. So you can imagine, you know, when it first turned up in Binghamton, New York, there was an audible gasp from the crowd, as, 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 as some reporter wrote, you know, when the hated black cra cross of the Bosch, you know, turned up in the heartland of America. I mean, it was really quite shocking for Americans to see this. Um, uh, but hardly, Hart 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 flew one of these, and remarkably, he actually completed the round trip journey in a, in a, in a Fokker D7, which is pretty astonishing. Now, let's go for some of the big stuff as well, because you've got the Martin Bomber with sort of an eclectic crew of almost anybody jumping on board with that one as well haven't you I, I it was just astonishing this this sort of opening section of your book it, it seems that this captured the imagination of almost everyone who could fly or had flown they wanted to be a part of this because you, you've got some interesting i don't really want to call them passengers but they were jumping on the race in long island weren't they well you, you may be referring to the uh, french defense attache i mean billy mitchell was a francophone he'd actually lived in france as a child um and uh he in the spirit of, of anglo french friendship he invited the the french defense attache to compete in, in the race and as it happened this guy was a decorated combat aviator in his own right so he was a perfectly capable uh pilot uh 
Uh, but but Mitchell assigned him to ride with Braley Gish, the the you know former track star who I mentioned with the with the injured legs. And Gish was very unhappy about this because you know he he wanted a mechanic who could help service his plane because it was hard for him to do it on his own. But he you know obviously when Billy Mitchell gives you an order, you you take it. And uh, and then the other the, the other sort of unusual uh, contestant in the race, for, foreigner, was the. Um, British defense attache, who was also a decorated combat aviator named Lionel Charlton, who flew in a, in a British uh, Bristol fighter. And again, it was all part of the spirit of, of the uh, wartime alliance and, and maintaining those relationships. Guy de Laverne, the French uh, gentleman, ha had a rather interesting race. I should, I should just tell you one quick story going back to Braley Gish. About an hour or two out of, uh, out of Long Island, I guess a couple of hours, they'd landed at Binghamton and were on their way to Rochester. Uh, the engine erupted in flames in their DH-4, as, as engines occasionally did in that era. And uh, Braley gets very, very skillfully put it into a dive to blow out the flames, which, by the way, set his helmet on fire briefly. I mean, this was a serious engine fire. And uh, he pancaked uh, over a ravine and uh, overturned, but neither, got, neither he nor Guy de la Verne were, were hurt. They hitched a ride to Rochester, spent the night there. De La Verne then hopped on the Martin bomber and continued west. Uh, and Gish went back to Long Island to start again. And that's sort of where his fame began to grow uh, in the press. Dodgy legs starting the race twice. What a guy. Yeah. Oh, there's more to it than that. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, that was just the beginning for him. <laughs> Read, read the read the book, ladies and gentlemen, because we're, yeah. we're not gonna we're not gonna spoil it too much. Yeah. But what we do want to talk about is the weather, because this really is a development of aeronautical weather in the United States. There's the fantastic line that the Air Service was not assuming any responsibility for accuracy right. along the route, and there's all through the book. There's interesting stories of weather reports being passed back and forth that nobody really either wants to believe or just generally they just think it's nobody can be sure how does this race help develop the sort of weather service for aviation in the states well it's, it's interesting that you bring that up because to me that was what, something that i i found more most surprising in my research i mean the state of weather forecasting in 1919 was more advanced than you might think i mean it certainly was not nearly as reliable as it is today but but since the mid 19th century you know the, the smithsonian's institution had had a network of field stations around the country that reported bar barometric pressure uh, back to Washington. And that was, you know, compiled into a daily weather map, which, you know, was still, which was issued uh, right up through the time of the race. And of course, it's still issued today. And, you know, if, as a pilot looking at the weather maps that were issued in 1919 for this race, they look remarkably similar to the weather maps we have today. I mean, they show the pressure gradients, the, you know, the isobars and and you can tell the areas of low and high pressure and where it's going to be windy and where it's going to be calm. And, you know, you have some indication of precipitation. So they had, you know, a, a, a surprisingly good sort of overall picture of the weather, but it was, in, it was inconsistent and there was really no system for a, reporting aviation weather. I mean, during the war, Mitchell had grasped uh, early on the importance of aviation weather because you obviously can't fly a combat operation if, the, you know, if there's the clouds are down to the ground. Um, and, uh, you know, particularly in an age before instrument flying. Uh, so he, you know, put a premium on accurate weather reporting and, and they, they use these things called theodolites, uh, which they were basically like a surveyor's transit and they would release a balloon and it would go aloft. And on that, they would track the balloon with this theodolite on that basis. They would be able to, you know, judge things like, you know, winds aloft, for example, which is obviously of critical importance to an aviator. And uh, and the, the cloud ceiling stuff like that. So they were, you know, they they were pretty inventive. Um, and, uh, and there was a, you know, something like five hundred uh, uh, meteorologists and physicists who, who were deployed uh, during the war to to uh, refine forecasting techniques. So they had a pretty good grounding by the time of the race. They did what they didn't have was any kind of a, a regular system for disseminating this information. So it was kind of ad hoc. I mean, they, again, they kind of made it up on the fly. And it, in some ways, it, it worked fairly well. I mean, one of the big incidents that I mentioned in the race, and I'll talk about it because it happens early in the book, so I don't think I'm, this is a major spoiler, but uh, there was a terrible snowstorm on day two of the race in uh, Wyoming. And uh, the guy who was in charge of weather forecasting for the race, was his name was Mr. Bowie, and he was at the Weather Bureau in Washington, which was part of the Agriculture Department at the time. 
<clears throat> and uh, he saw this coming. And he, he sent a very detailed, urgent telegram to the control stops in Rawlins, Wyoming and Green River, Wyoming, saying, you know, dangerous conditions in mountains today. He, he, he called it. He saw the snow coming. He said it was going to be dangerous. Uh, but for some reason, the system broke down and that forecast never made it to Salt Lake City. So a bunch of the guys who were flying from West East took off from Salt Lake City and they didn't know what they were flying into, even though the information had been available you know, was available. So there was some breakdown in communication along the way. So that happened a lot during the race. The, it's not that the information wasn't necessarily there. It's just that they weren't very good about getting it to flyers in a timely fashion. Because we're talking about really quite rudimentary aircraft. You know, we, we've become quite nude and normal to jumping on an airplane, flying at 35,000 feet for however long getting there, seeing pictures. You know, gone are the days you get to visit the cockpit, but you know, glass cockpits with all the fancy stuff. These guys are flying it with little more than a, a compass and an RPM gauge, aren't they? There's 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 not really a lot in any of these aircraft to help them. Yeah, I mean, there's like there's a te engine temperature gauge. There's a, maybe an oil pressure gauge. Uh, uh, there's an air, airspeed indicator, obviously, an altimeter, um, uh, but really nothing in the way of you know like spatial awareness instruments with like artificial horizons things like that those were those were coming they were coming sooner than you might think i mean there was this ferry company in, in brooklyn was already developing gyroscopic instruments but sort of on an, on an experimental basis none of them were actually deployed in this race the closest thing they had uh for, for in terms of sort of uh situational awareness for example when flying in clouds was they, they some of them had a uh a bubble indicator it was sort of like a, a carpenter's level just a, a, basically a curved fluid filled tube with a bubble in it, which would give them some indication of, of their bank angle. So that was obviously helpful if you were flying in, in conditions of poor visibility. But for the most part, it was it was seat of the pants flying. And I, and I hadn't really appreciated the fact until I researched this book that seat of the pants was actually has a very practical meaning to early aviators. Had it for, they would sense the pressure on their butts and they, you know, and you and of course, I, I mean, I had an instructor who taught me this when I was flying. Uh, you, you know, you can you can tell whether you're in a slip or a skid based on you know the feel the pressure in, in your seat, and um, uh, so when they talked about flying by the seat of the pants, they meant flying by the seat of the pants, and that was in some ways the most reliable indicator that they had uh, uh, in terms of how the aircraft was performing. Now, the problem was is that you know in conditions of zero visibility, the inner ear plays all kinds of tricks, and and your brain will often override what you're other senses are telling you. Um, uh, so um, they really, uh, even though they flew in what we would consider instrument conditions all the time, they really weren't equipped to do so. I'm being careful because I don't want to spoil all the good bits of the books. My notes got far too detailed because I was enjoying it too much. But you know, the, especially the guys flying west to east through the, the Sierras, these are aircraft that can't fly over mountains. So they're flying through the passes that would have taken people west beforehand anyway so you know they're flying into very tricky conditions e e even today for, for for smaller aircraft with with gusts of winds and wind shear and things like that and you know you have that the terrible story of, of um wales and gainsborough who who, who crashed and I, I think we can maybe spoil spoil this one because it's you know they they don't make it very far and have a have a very sad end don't they that's right. I mean, when I was talking about this blizzard and the guys who left from Salt Lake City without knowing what the weather that lay ahead, uh, you know, they were they were in that group that they reached Salt Lake City on the first day of the race from San Francisco. They were held up uh, in, in Salt Lake City. They wanted to continue, but the field at Green River wasn't actually ready yet. It was still wet from the snow. So they, they, they the, the control officer held them for the night. So they all left the next morning, not knowing what weather they were flying into. It was nice weather in Salt Lake City. They had no ne necessarily didn't have any reason to believe that they were flying into a storm. And, you know, some of them made it and some of them didn't. I mean, I, I will tell you, like Tui Spatz, who you mentioned, uh, and Captain Lowell Smith, who was a very well-known, capable aviator, uh, were in sort of the same group. And, and another guy named uh, Emil Keel, another very capable flyer. And they got to Rollins, Wyoming, shortly before Wales and Goldsboro, and continued on their way but it was a it was a harrowing trip to cheyenne i mean uh tui spatz yeah he 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 wanted to fly the direct line from rollins to cheyenne because it was faster whereas if you were following the railroad you had to detour around elk mountain uh to the north 
and it would add about 40 minutes to the trip. And of course they were in a race. Uh, so Spatz, you know, very reluctantly, cause he was an extremely competitive guy. Uh, and he knew he was one of the, one of the leaders at that point with a real shot at winning the race. Spatz decides very reluctantly, okay, I'm going to do the sensible thing. I'm going to follow the railroad tracks. Even that he had to fly 50 feet off the ground because the, you know, the clouds were so low, it was snowing so hard. He called it a snow hurricane and he would literally have to sort of slalom around water towers. You know, they would have water towers by the railroad tracks at each of the towns. And so these things would loom out of the snow and he would have to put the thing into a, into a bank to slalom around. And then he had to navigate these canyons towards the end to get to Cheyenne. But he, he made it, he landed in, a, in, in like a 50 or 60 knot wind in, in Cheyenne and broke a wing skid when his plane was hit by a gust. But, and uh, the others made it too. But Wales and Goldsboro decided to fly the direct line uh, because, you know, they were young and competitive and they wanted to win and they knew they were near the front. They could have easily caught up with Spats and the others. Uh, and so they made the call uh, to fly the direct line and they found themselves trapped in a mountain pass with in zero visibility. And uh, uh, all of, they found themselves sort of nose to nose with a, with a mountain uh, pulled up to try and, and uh, avoid it, put the plane into a stall and spun in uh, and uh, since you'll allow me to tell this one story, I'll, I'll, I might as well complete it. Uh, the plane came to rest in a ravine. It, it spun in from about 200 feet. And uh, the guy in the front, Wales, the pilot, was very badly hurt. His friend, Goldsboro, in the back uh, was unconscious, but, you know, it wasn't, he wasn't seriously hurt. Came to, came to his senses in a few minutes. Snowing very hard. Uh, he pulls his friend out, builds a fire to keep him warm, props up a broken aileron to uh, uh, try and uh, block the wind and goes off in search of a ranch house that he's spotted, you know, he'd spotted before they crashed, goes in the wrong direction. But a couple hours later, he finally comes to another ranch house with a bunch of cowboys, find, you know, and uh, he gets them to organize a rescue party and they follow his tracks back up to the crash. And by then, of course, uh, Wales has died. Um, and uh, so that was a huge story on day two of the race. And, and you know, the, all of this is disastrous for Mitchell because he's trying to show how great aviation is and how safe it is and how commercial aviation is the future. And here these guys are dropping like flies and it's not even the second day of the third day of the race. And you flew over because you flew the route yourself, didn't you? you, you, you I did. I, yeah. it's, it's funny. I, I did. So when I when I flew out, I flew east to west. I, I took off. Well, Roosevelt Field is now a shopping mall, so you can't leave from Roosevelt <laughs> Field. But I, I left from Republic Airport, which is a few miles away on Long Island, in a my very small two seat light sport, which was actually a good good plane to recreate the route in because it, it had a hundred horsepower engine. It really flew about the same speed as these old biplanes, and I flew at about the same altitude, maybe three thousand feet above ground level. So flying out when I got to Cheyenne, you know, I did kind of go back and forth. Do I want to fly the direct line? or should I be more cautious? And of course, in terms of navigation, there's no challenge these days with GPS. It's kind of idiot proof. You know, you just put in the airport code and, you know, follow the magenta line and, and there you are. Uh, there's not much to it, but I thought, you know, I'm, I'm, I have no experience in mountain flying. I've never taken a course in mountain flying. Um, I'm going to be cautious and I'm going to follow the train tracks, which I actually followed Interstate 80, which parallels the train tracks. But coming back from San Francisco, I thought, you know, that was pretty easy. I don't think it's that big of a deal. And so I picked a nice day. I, I, I spent the night in Rock Springs, Wyoming, because you can't land in Green River anymore. Uh, and I, I flew past Rollins and uh, I, I had located the crash site through some re my research, uh, old newspapers, and also a, a local aviation historian in Wyoming, who was a former professional pilot that had the GPS coordinates that he shared with me. So I knew exactly where to go. And, uh, and I did, I fly, I flew through, uh, Oberg pass. It's called, uh, about 20 minutes, uh, east of Rollins, Wyoming on the way to Cheyenne. And it's a very benign flight in good weather. And I, you know, I had a 12,000 foot ceiling, calm winds, unlimited visibility. So it was really nothing to it, but I could certainly see how in a snowstorm it would have been, you know, very challenging. Uh, and, uh, you know, I chopped the power and kind of coasted over the treetops, uh, on the, along the mountainside. And it was really kind of a moving experience to know that really, I, I did my flight in 2019. So it was really just a hundred years later that I was doing the same flight. Um, and I, yeah, and then nothing, the landscape hasn't changed. It's still a very remote wild part of Wyoming. Um, so I think for me, that was the time maybe I felt in some ways kind of most connected 
to the flyers in the race. Like, and uh, actually, you know, it's, it's an experience that really stayed with me. How, how did that feed into how you crafted the book? Well, I did not want the book to be about me. Um, and as I said, there's just, there's just no comparison to flying that route, even in a small plane, you know, with, with, I mean, I had an autopilot, I had, you know, <laughs> GPS and satellite weather and, you know, I, traffic reporting. I mean, I can, you, know, you can see with other airplanes are equipped with transponders, which allows you to see their position relative to yours. I mean, there's just, there's so much information that you have on a, a modern uh, instrument panel and, uh, compared to a century ago. Uh, I, I just thought, you know, I, I didn't want to make it about me. Um, so I, I mean, I, I sort of in, introduced myself in the prologue and then that's it. And the, the book is about the race. And then after the epilogue, there's a fairly short chapter in which I describe my flight because I thought it made a, it, it was a, you know, just sort of what it's like to fly the same route a century later. I thought it was a useful sort of coda to the whole story. It, it kind of showed in a way how far aviation had come, but it also, I think, um, emphasized the connection that, you know, flyers still have to these pioneers who went before us. So let's wrap this up with the Sophie's Choice question. Of all the pilots that you researched and we'll say met along the way of the, the process of writing the book, who is your favorite? Who is, who is the one you'd like to, to catch up with, have a, have a beer with? Definitely don't want to have a beer with Belvin Maynard since he didn't drink beer. <laughs> um, uh, that, you know, I got to say maybe Tui Spatz. Um, I mean, he, he's such a, an impressive character in so many ways. I mean, he, he was, he's obviously quite brilliant as he would later prove during the course of his, you know, for very sort of spectacular career. I mean, he was the first chief of staff of the Air Force after World War II, uh, buried at the Air Force Academy. Uh, but I liked him because he was, he had this kind of like irreverent side. He, he hated sort of Mickey Mouse rules. Um, he almost got chucked out of West Point for, for uh, keeping liquor in his room. He was still marching. Uh, he's still marching off his demerits on graduation day in, in the, you know, courtyard. Um, so he was always sort of in trouble as a cadet. He loved flying. Um, he was not a showy guy. He didn't call attention to himself. Um, but he, he was, he had kind of a dry sense of humor and I, it just seemed like that's a guy who would be, you know, it'd be really cool to get to know a guy like that. Yeah. I'd have to agree. He, just taking this aspect out of it and, and I'll leave the rest of his career out. Just the, you know, the, the reluctance he initially had to, to even go back, which is another part of the book where right. having, having survived that, they've got to turn around and do it all again. Dear listener, we're not going to tell you who wins. For that, you need to buy John's book, which I can, I can thoroughly recommend. I found it fantastic fun to read. And I think that's probably a good place to say, well, again, ladies and gentlemen, go buy the book. But John, thank you so much for spending a bit of time with us discussing this incredible race. Well, thank you, Matt. My pleasure. I've enjoyed it. I have to thank John Lancaster once again for chatting with me about his book and to his publisher, W.W. W. Norton, for sending over a review copy. The Great Air Race is a lot more than just a book about pilots racing across the States. It shows us a snapshot in the development of what would become the most formidable air force in aviation, and most importantly, a few of the men who would shape it. The Great Air Race is out now in hardback in North America, but as of the time of this recording, we don't have a UK release date for it just yet. If you can track down a copy, I would highly recommend it. And when we get a UK date, I will share it on all of our social media channels. 2023 is shaping up to be an exciting year for the Damcasters, and I have to thank everyone who's come along for the ride so far. Of course, you can help by leaving a review for the show on the podcast app of your choice. This really helps with the algorithms as it suggests it to new listeners. And you can also tell your friends and get all the kudos for knowing about their new favorite podcast before they did. I do know times are tricky, but if you're in a position to be able to support the show financially, that would be amazing. It's over on the Patreon page, of course, which is patreon.com forward slash the Damcasters, all one word, where you'll get the episodes early and without all the ads that get popped in as well. Now, we have a big announcement coming up in the next few weeks, and it's going to be the Patreon supporters that hear it first. Of course, the news will be everywhere, but if you want to be ahead of the curve, that's where you're going to get it. I'm really excited about that. It's going to involve a trip to the States. 
there's a whole thing. Super excited. Regardless of that Patreon pitch, I have to thank everybody for supporting the show, for listening, for sharing it, for leaving some of the most beautiful reviews. They've been really touching. Thank you so much for that. But that's all we have time for this week. Until next time, as always, do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone, and it is a Boney Abroad podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.